How many of you knew that I was going to be talking about toxic family members this morning? Let me see your hands. Yeah. How many of you brought a toxic family member? <laughs> Might as well get this thing started right. You know what I'm talking about? All week. They, I've had some interesting conversations this week as people knew this topic was coming. Here's, what, here's what's happened every time. Whenever this topic would come up, toxic family member, I would see this it's like people lost focus on me and their mind rent, went right to a person. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh. And then they had a story they wanted to tell me. I know more about you. Oh, my goodness. People have been talking all week. Toxic family. There's just almost nothing like it. Last week, you know, we just talked about toxic people, toxic religious people. It's like, okay, that's cool, but I can kind of, you know, scoot in and out of that. It's not as easy to scoot in and out of family. Would you agree that the issue of having toxic family members is maybe some of your trickiest relationships in life? Would you agree with that? Some of it's proximity, like it's just hard to walk away. Some of it, like you live together. Some of it's you have family businesses together. There are just things that, that put family in proximity unlike almost anybody else in your life. So it's really tough to navigate. But it goes really deeper than that. Family hurts more. Like we do family... You have this assumption somewhere along the line that family should be safe, and it's not always. That family should be accepting, not always. That family should be that place where you could be your most authentic self and still be loved, not always. Family is that place where you could be completely honest. This is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I want. And you get that slapped down a few times. It's like, whoa, whoa, I can't even be honest here. And I think because nothing hurts quite like the pain of family, it's a really, really important discussion. Families, spiritual truth, can get whack. You know what I'm talking about? That's a very technical, professional term. Some of you wouldn't know it, but if you have a whack family, you know what I'm talking about. Like, bent out of shape, broken. It's just like it's, it's wrong. We're going to talk about it. Now, just to review, like to set some context, some people thought, coming into this series, How Do You Deal With Toxic People, that I was going to teach you how to be mean to toxic people. That's not what the series is about. This is not how you can, like, up your toxic game so you out-toxic the other person. That's not what this series is about. As a matter of fact, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our highest ethic for life is love. We're told we have to love God, and we are told we have to love others. The very best friend of Jesus, his name was John, he wrote this. Dear friends, let us love one another. Love comes from God. So just to kind of set the stage, love is the goal. Love is the goal. Say it with me. Love is the goal. So we're all on the same page. Love is the goal. Now, let me tell you what the series also is not. I'm not going to teach you how to love toxic people. That would actually be a good series. How do you show love? to unloving people. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. How do you be nice to mean people? One of the hardest things you'll ever do. That'd be a good series sometime. That's not what this series is about. This series is about how do you love yourself enough to make sure you're not being destroyed by the toxic people who are in your life. Because we're told in the scriptures, Jesus said this, love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. How many of you would have to admit your neighbors are in really bad shape because you love yourself so poorly? You know what I mean? Like if I love my neighbor like I love me, he's screwed. So you've got to make sure that you love yourself. And that's what this series is about. How do you demonstrate a level of self-love, self-care when it comes to the toxic people who are in your life? Because here's the truth about it. We can tolerate a little toxic, but a lot of toxic will destroy it, like, okay, a little toxic in a relationship. Relationship might just be sick, but it might survive. But if it gets too toxic, that relationship dies. Toxic relationships can break and kill your spirit. Toxic relationships can break and kill your joy. Like a little, you don't want it, but a little, you can survive it. A lot, not so much. Give an example. Now, I hope other people in this room have done this. Occasionally, especially when I was single, before I was married, this happened a lot. Karen's really good about checking expiration dates and things in our refrigerator. I never cared, you know. I just eat it. How many of you have ever reached in and you've taken a bite of something, and while you're chewing it, you're looking over what's left, and there's something growing there? 
Thank you. I'm not the only one. Who's done that? You've got a decision to make. <laughs> yeah, pointing to people. You've got a decision to make there. Here's what I know. Nobody says this. Nobody says this. Oh, penicillin. I'll just take more. Nobody does that. <laughs> Here's what people do. People say, did I eat too much to survive? <laughs> like, am I just going to get sick? Or like, am I dying now? Because what we know with food a little bit might just make you sick, but too much might make you dead. And we need to understand the same thing is true in relationships. So I want to get that out there. Here's another thing I want to get out there. A toxic person and an irritating person are not the same thing. Just because somebody's irritating doesn't mean they're toxic. Because, like, irritation... It could be a personality conflict. It could be the way they chew their food. I mean, it can be some very just like normal things in life that irritate you, but they're not toxic. Like there are days, like with family members, where you're irritated at your family. That doesn't mean it's toxic. There are days you're irritated with everybody. That doesn't mean everybody's toxic. Here's the difference. Irritating is just irritating. Toxic is damaging. It's damaging. Like all of a sudden, chunks of your heart go flying off. Parts of your spirit get crushed. That's what happens when a relationship or the dynamic in a relationship becomes toxic. So let's start breaking this down. I want to start with some toxic family member facts. Some toxic family member facts. So if you're taking notes, go ahead and grab this. Number one, we all have toxic family members. Yes, you do. We all have toxic family members. You're not alone in this. All families struggle with this. It might be two distant cousins who haven't talked to each other in years, but the family always understands there is this horrible dynamic between these two people over here, and if we're all thrown together in some family setting, that's going to be poisonous over there. It might be that sister-in-law that everybody talks about when she's not in the room anymore. You don't have to look too far to find toxicity in every family. And listen to me. This has always been true. From the beginning of families, this has been true. Like, we take it back. You read the ancient Hebrew text. You go back to the ancient Christian scriptures, and you find that this has always been true. The first family ever. One guy kills his brother. That's very, very toxic. I mean, you just got to know. There's a story of a guy who had a child by his wife's maid. He was a governor in California. <laughs> <coughs> oh, stop. It's not too soon. It's not too soon. It's not. It's not. In the scripture, his name was Abraham. <laughs> hey, some of you have been here before, so it's your fault. You know what you're getting. <laughs> you know, new people, I apologize. Abraham. Listen, not only did he have a baby by his wife's maid, but then his wife didn't want him around. Duh. <laughs> and so Abraham sent them to the desert to die. That's toxic. A guy named Joseph had 11 brothers. They hated him, hated their brother, jealous of their brother. But instead of killing him, they thought they'd get money for him, so they sold him into human trafficking. Toxic. A guy named Jacob deceives his blind father so that he can get more of the family's estate when his dad dies. That's toxic. And listen, all of that's in the first book of the Bible. I mean, we haven't even gotten past the first pages of human history. So some of you are thinking, well, compared to that, my family looks pretty good. Others of you are thinking, compared to that, that's just exactly like my family. And maybe that's the point. See, some of you could actually walk out right now with a little bit of hope that you did not have because you'd gotten so isolated in the pain and the toxic situation in your home, you think, like, I'm the only one, nobody would understand. The truth of it is somebody would know and somebody would understand. And there are people you can talk to about this because they've gone through it too. I would never give details, never give details, but I'm texting with this heartbroken person yesterday and I reach out to another person who'd had similar heartbreak and I said, hey, could you and you get together and talk because this one, this one's going to understand this one's pain. And that's a beautiful thing. So some of you already know just looking around, it's like, 
Well, I'm not alone. I am not alone in this. All families have faced this. Here's the stuff that makes families toxic. Jealousy, entitlement, lying, favoritism, unfair expectations, fear, power struggles, materialism, sexual sin, anger, no forgiveness, selfishness. I mean, you can pick a word and probably identify it to a scenario that your family is trying to live through. When we talk about toxic people, we're not talking about irritating people. We're also not talking about imperfect people. Like just being sinful, just being imperfect doesn't mean you're toxic. Here's what makes it go from like just simple maybe imperfection or sin to toxic is when we get stuck in that pattern. When, when we become imprisoned in that place. Like I can't get past the bitterness. I can't get past the anger. I can't get out of this unhealthy pattern of communication that's always damaging. It's when we get stuck that it becomes poisonous. Fact number one, all families face this. Point number two, all toxic relationships are not equal. You know, don't put the same weight on everything. Like, you know, well, I just tend to always bicker with this person, and I just hate that, and I know it's not doing any good for her, and it's not doing any good for me, but we're just kind of stuck in that place. That's a level of toxic. But then there are deeper levels, more profound levels of damage and pain. So don't make it all equal. Number three, when it's toxic, you must act. When it's toxic, you must act. You have to take action when you see that it's toxic. Here's the thing. We spend too much time trying to fix blame and not nearly enough time fixing the problem. Like most of what I do through my week is coaching people in their life, you know, issues. And what I find way too often, all somebody wants to do is be right. Like, I just need you to let him know how right I am and how wrong he is. I mean, that's why we're here, just so you can take my side and make him wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrongy, wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> and here's what happens. They never move forward because somebody's trying to fix blame rather than getting on the same side of the table and let's take on the issue and fix the issue. You've got to understand that, that the action that's required is more than fixing blame. It's actually trying to find a solution. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to get on the solution side of this. Today I want to offer you four prayers that you can pray when you find yourself in a toxic family dynamic. Four prayers. You say, Brad, why would you give us prayer? I'll tell you why. You probably already know because you need God's help to deal with this right. I need God's help to deal with this right. So we're going to ask God for his help to deal with this right in four specific ways. And here we go. Prayer number one, Father, help me to accept my limitations. Father, help me to accept my limitations. See, you wouldn't need to be concerned about how much poison you ingest if you're Superman or Superwoman. You would need to worry about how hard people knock you around with their words or their actions if you're a superhero. But the fact is you're not. And the truth is you are not indestructible. And the truth is you can be harmed and damaged. And the truth is too many of you have stayed in there thinking that you're more than you are, that you can take it longer than you should, and the damage just keeps multiplying. We looked last week at Jesus, Son of God, Jesus, Son of God, Son of God, Jesus who knew that this group of people were planning to do him harm, toxic, rather than son of God. He could have taken them on. Nope. They're over there. I'm going over here. Now, I want to ask you a question. Just be honest. It's going to take a level of humility. Are you better than Jesus? Stronger than Jesus? More capable than Jesus? The answer is no. So if Jesus understood that, we need to understand that. You were never designed to drink poison over and over and over again. I was never designed to be punched in the face over and over and over again. There is a point where we have to say, look, look, I'm just a person here. I have my limitations. I can get hurt. I can get destroyed. I have to make sure I'm taking a little care here. Here's the image from one Christian writer about our limitations. It says, we are like clay jars. Would you circle that phrase, clay jars? We are like clay jars in which this treasure, the presence of Jesus, is stored. The real power comes from God, not from us. Here's the image. <clears throat> in the ancient culture, people didn't have safety deposit boxes. They didn't have, you know, uh, home 
security systems or safes to store their valuable stuff. It, what they had ready access to were clay jars. Everybody could have access to clay jars. So that's where they'd put their stuff. They would put their kitchen wares in clay jars. They'd put their flour and grain in clay jars. They'd also put their valuables in clay jars. There was no strength or real protection or value. It's just a place to store. The real value is inside, but the storage unit itself is pretty fragile. So when archaeologists, you know, uncover places and they expose rooms and they see stacks and stacks and stacks of clay jars, over time what they found is that all of them are cracked and the interior goods have spilled out because clay jars are fragile. They're not indestructible. They break pretty easily. And so what the writer is saying is that we're all crackpots. I mean, that's in the Bible. We're all, we're all, that, we're all that fragile. And I got to tell you, if you admit this, there's some freedom to it. You, you mean I don't have to be, you know, Lord of the universe and be strong at all times and just take this over and over again and, and bear up under it? No, you don't. Matter of fact, God didn't design you to. You are not indestructible. You're a clay jar, you're a clay jar, you're a clay jar. Now I could list dozens of ways that we're limited, like our limitations, human limitations. Let me just give you a couple. Here's one. I'm not God. You want to write that down. I'm not God. You get to resign as God of the universe. You don't have to be the one, the be all, know all, do all. You're not God. You're not. We forget that sometimes. We think we're more than we are, and so we stay in the poison longer than we should. I'm a clay jar. I'm not God. Because I'm not God, the second one makes sense. I cannot force someone else to change. I cannot force someone else to change. Do you know something God did way at the beginning? When God created people way at the beginning, you know what he decided? I'm never going to force someone to change. He decided at the beginning, I'll never force someone to change. It's called free will. He lets us choose to change, but he never makes us change. Now listen, if God doesn't do that, even though God could do it, if God doesn't do that, why do we think that we're more than God and we can, in fact, force someone else to change? I think it's a reason we stay in toxic situations longer than we should because we believe more about ourselves than we should. And we believe by staying in it, somehow we're going to change him. If I'm just nice enough, he won't be abusive. If I'm just smart enough, I'll have an answer. If I'm just sneaky enough, you know, I'll trick him into, if I'm just enough enough, you're clay jar. You're not God. You're not going to change him. But I want to make it work out. It's not the problem. They don't want it to work out. And you're not going to change him. Are you tracking with me? I'm not God. And I don't have the power to change them. I can only work on me. For some of you, for the first time, you're in such a toxic place and have almost lost all perspective and hope and you're thinking that, that may be part of my answer. Like I, I believe too much about myself and my superpowers and my ability to make this person be different than, than they are. And maybe you can just take a breath. Maybe just inhale for a minute. And then exhale for a minute and say, it's, it's actually not up to me. We acknowledge our limitation. Okay, second prayer. Father, help me to forgive my family. Some of you are like, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> Go on to number three. <laughs> well, guess what? Nope, not going to do it. <laughs> We're going to stay right here for a minute. Brad, if you only knew what they did to me. I'll never accept what they did to me. Here, he, please hear me. I'm not asking you to accept what they did to you. I'm not asking you to say it was good. It may have been pure evil. Forgiveness is not accepting. Forgiveness is releasing. I let it go. And I intentionally give it to God. Either I'm going to hold it and wrestle it and, and, and let that stew in me, or I'm going to let God hold it and let God handle it. Rather than me figuring out my path to revenge. That's not up to me how this all works out. I'm giving the outcome of this to God. Rather, I'm just going to hold on to the bitterness. That's not smart. 
That's like drinking poison waiting for the other person to die. Take that. <laughs> Hope you feel that. You know. They're fine. You're killing you. Here's what bitter people find out pretty quickly. The harm I did to myself by holding on to bitterness is actually greater than the harm they did to me in the first place. So when we give it to God, I give up my right to seek revenge. I give up my desire to stay mad and bitter and angry about that. I give that up to God. I release it. I'm not going to hold on to it. Lord, here it is. Here it is. I don't want to wrestle this anymore. I don't want to feel this anymore. I, I'm like forgiving to God first. I'm going to release it to them. Now, let me just give you a couple uh, real life scenarios here. I told you it happens in every family. That's why great families require great forgiveness. This happened even with the followers of Jesus and their families. Like the people closest to the Son of God had family drama and toxicity. That's why Simon Peter, he always asked good questions. He was a follower of Jesus, and he asked Jesus, Lord, how long should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? He's just pulling that one out. He like knew if I said, Jesus, should I forgive him once? That probably wasn't the right answer. So he's like, you know, I'll just make it a factor of seven. Like, could it be seven times? Like, and Jesus is like, dude. Now, he may not have said dude. He said, Peter, <laughs> multiply that by 70. Seven times 70. For most of you, whoever you need to forgive, you're thinking forgiving once is hard. Almost nearly impossible, it feels like. Forgiving seven times, I think Peter was making an extraordinary offer to offer to forgive seven times. But when Jesus comes back with 70 times seven, that's beyond the realm. That's like more, like no, nobody can do that. And I think if we went to Jesus and said, nobody could do that, I think Jesus would say, exactly. I'm not asking you to do something you can do by yourself. You're going to need my help on this one. That's why I'm offering us prayers today. It's an acknowledgement, like to forgive as we should, to forgive when we should, to forgive multiple times as we should. That's beyond human. That takes the help of God in our life. Sometimes I have to compare what I've been forgiven for and then, like, apply God's forgiveness to me, like, to another person. Have you ever done this? Now, some of you have lived, like, really squeaky clean lives, and God bless you. Uh, <laughs> I really want to mean that. Um, but, but forgiveness is not a profound experience in your life. There just hadn't been a lot maybe to forgive you for. It's not true in my life. For, forgiveness is a profound experience in my life because of the pile of choices and behaviors that God's had to forgive me for. And so sometimes when I don't want to forgive somebody and I'm wanting to hang on to it and I'm struggling with that I need to do this, what I have to do is like take a time out here and go back over here and look at that pile and thank God forgave me for that, I can forgive them for that. Sometimes I need the example of Jesus' forgiveness to help me forgive. Does that make sense? Sometimes I need just the sheer power of Jesus. Jesus, if this is going to happen, you're going to have to do it in me because I'm struggling with this one. Now, like playing this out in your family, let me just give you a scenario. Let's just suppose somebody in your family was saying really horrible things about you. This would never happen in a family. This is hypothetical. But pretend that there's a family member who's spewing all this venom about you. And you think to yourself, oh, pastor just talked about forgiveness last Sunday, so I guess I have to forgive. What do you do? Do you go and forgive them immediately? They didn't ever say they were sorry. Do you write them a note and say, I know you were talking trash about me, but I forgive you. What, what do you do? 
Scripture gives us a little guidance here. Look at this one. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. How did God forgive us in Christ? Immediately and completely. Immediately and completely. He said, oh, so i got to forgive them immediately. So I write them a note, I forgive you. They never said they were sorry. Well, hang on, hang on. Because there's another verse that seems to be different. Jesus teaches this. If you see your friend doing wrong, correct him. If he responds, that might be an apology or whatever, but circle that. If he responds, forgive him. Huh. Even if it's personal against you and repeated seven times throughout the day, and seven times, look what the other guy does, says, I'm sorry. So circle the phrase, says, I'm sorry. Then you forgive him. Again. It seems like in one verse, it's like immediate. In the next verse, it's like you wait till you say they're sorry. How do you play that out? Here's how. When I was talking about give it to God, release it to God, like you forgive it to God first, start there. There's your immediate. Immediately, when you feel this unforgiveness in your heart, you know that that's what you want to do, need to do. It's the healthiest thing to do, and you're struggling with it. Then you start that work between you and God immediately. You pay the price. Like, God, I want to hold on to bitterness, but I'm going to need you to help clean that out of me. God, I just can't. Every time I see him, I just want to punch somebody. God, help me. And you start that vertical work of forgiveness immediately. Immediately. And then when you've done that work, it's like, okay, okay, God's handling it. I've given it up. I've released it. I've forgiven it to God first. Then I encounter this person, and they say to me, you know, like, I, I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I can do it then because I've already done the vertical work. Let me give an example. Like, if you want to surprise somebody with a gift, a couple things have to happen. First of all, you have to have money. Usually to get money, you have to work. So you work and you get money so you can buy the gift. You with me so far? So the work of forgiveness is giving up my right to stay mad, giving up the bitterness I want to hang on to. I'm not going to let them off the hook. You give up the right to hold them on the hook. You give up the desire to, to seek revenge. You do that work so that you can get the gift of forgiveness in your heart, the most beautiful thing you can put in your heart is forgiveness. So now forgiveness is there, and you've done the work for it, and the gift is there. So now somebody comes to you sometime later and says, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? It's immediate because the work's already been done. The gift has already been purchased. You see what I'm saying? The payment for that's already, I've done all that. Vertically, immediately, then I wait. So I have this beautiful gift in my heart. They don't have it yet. It's in my heart. They receive it when they ask for it, but I've done the work and forgiveness is already filling me. I'm, I'm already forgiving because of the work I've done. Are you tracking with me? Can somebody say yes? Because I would start over. You know that. I would go right back to the beginning. Welcome to California Community Church. The governor of California. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that again. Once is enough because you can't just keep going back to that same joke. You can't do it. Here's the point. You forgive it to God immediately. You give it to their face when asked. You give it to God immediately. There's the immediate. And then you give it to their face when they ask. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that easy? No. Is it difficult? Yes. That's why this is a prayer. Because we have to ask for God's strength to forgive as we should. Prayer number three. Father, help me change my thinking. Help me change my thinking. Let me tell you how, how toxic behavior can affect the way you think. So you're, you're having this dynamic that's toxic and it's repeated and it's damaging. One of two things will always happen. The first would be your thoughts about the toxic person become toxic. So they're mean, you start to be mean up here. They say horrible things. Man, what you're saying up here, it's a scary. Do you see what? So it can affect how you think about them. Here's the other one. And I see this like a lot in families. Because family is the place we're supposed to get our self-esteem. Family is the place we're supposed to get our sense of security. Family is the place where we really get our identity formed. 
And if toxic stuff like you're ugly, you'll never amount to anything, you're a loser, you so-and-so, we start to think toxic about us. One of those two things is just normal. This is the normal reaction. Somebody's toxic to you, your mind goes toxic toward them, or your mind goes toxic towards you. One of those two things happen. That's why we're instructed. we got to change that. The change is going to be in how we think. And fortunately, we're given some guidance here. Look at this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. What's the pattern of the world? They're toxic to me. My thoughts go toxic to them. They're toxic to me. My thoughts go toxic to me too. That's normal. That's the pattern. We're trying to break this cycle. We're trying to break the pattern of toxic. So we renew our mind. Our minds are transformed. Then we can live God's way, and that pleases God. Before I do something different, I have to think something different. Say it with me. Before I do something different, I have to think something different, and that's why you pray. God, God, I need your help. Help me to think differently. Change my thinking. <clears throat> Let me tell you how this like, played out in my life. As I said a little earlier, there was a season in my life when all my choices were self-destructive. Every one of them, 100% self-destructive. But my choices weren't just hurting me. They were also destructive and toxic to the people around me. Now, as I began to heal from that season, my biggest struggle, like the last part of healing that it seemed to take the longest to deal with, was lingering shame. You ever been ashamed? Shame is what you think about you. Shame is what you think. It's something you think about yourself. And I will say, a lot of that was self-imposed. I mean, it was coming from within me. I was saying about me, you don't deserve a second chance. You don't deserve to be forgiven. You don't deserve a better life. You, some of the toxic about me, some of the shameful thoughts were coming from me. Some of them were coming from others. Others were, you're right. You don't deserve a second chance. You are the scum of the earth. Those kind of things. Self-imposed, externally imposed, and I was thinking that about me. Here's what God helped me realize. He helped me realize that I would always have those thoughts of shame available to me for the rest of my life. Like, I could access it right now if I chose to. I used to think that this verse that said the renewing of your mind meant that you would never have old thoughts again. It's not what it means. It means we now have the power of Christ to help us access new thoughts. And here's the truth. I can access my old thoughts of shame just like I could walk into a closet and access my clothes on a hanger. I don't choose that. I do choose that. They're hanging there. I just am choosing, will I put that on or not? Here's what's said about Christians, followers of Christ, that we're new creations in Christ. Here's what that means, that we now have access, like hanging in our closet, we now have access to new thoughts, new identity. I could continue to live in that place and, and stay in the shame. I could continue to think that. Or I could think about who I am now because of the work of Christ in me. Do you see that? It's this idea that before I can do a different thing, I've got to deal with how I think about it. And it's the power of Jesus that helps you do that. One of the most important lessons of life related to your thinking is that it is never a once and done. Like, oh, the first day I went, the first, I, I almost remember. I remember roughly the time period. When I had gone through a day, and it's like, I didn't want to die. That was a big deal. I didn't feel ashamed. That was a big deal. It wasn't once and done. Like I had a good day, but it didn't mean tomorrow's going to be a good day. I had to get up, go into the closet of my mind, and carefully select 
the thought clothes that I would put on. See how this works? I always have access to the other part of my closet. It's there. But I'm choosing. I'm choosing what to think, and I'm doing that with God's help. Now, here's how he helps us. First, the Spirit of God empowers my mind. That means that it is his power that gives me the ability to choose better thoughts. And then the Word of God enlightens my mind. Did you know the Scripture is called like a lamp on your path? You're walking in the dark so you don't stumble and fall and stub your toe and all that. God's words give us some light so that we know these new thoughts. So the Word of God says I'm a child of God. The Word of God says I'm forgiven. The Word of God says I am a new creation. The Word of God says I can begin again. So that gives me light for new thoughts. And then I love this third one. The community of God encourages my mind. The Word of God encourages my mind. Here's what that means. Sometimes you need people around you who aren't thinking toxic about you to help you think straight. Let me tell you something interesting. When you become afraid, when you have the emotion of fear, you immediately lose 25 points of IQ. And for some of us, we can't afford <laughs> to lose 25 points of IQ. When you are worried, 25 points. When you're bitter, you lose 100 points. Like while you're consumed with thoughts of anger and resentment and bitterness, your mind isn't thinking straight about the rest of your life. Because you're consumed by that, and your IQ plummets. Your IQ drops by 50 points when you feel guilty. Emotions affect clear thinking. That's why we need people around us who will say things like, have you ever tried thinking about it like this? Or I understand why you're feeling the way you are, but from someone who's not like in the middle of that heat, I'm a little more objective, let me just give you a different perspective on that. See, they can't do it in the middle of the fire. But someone standing around them, encouraging them, can give greater clarity in their thinking. That's why we're given this encouragement in Scripture. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us what? Encourage one another. We get better together. We get better together. Say it with me. We get better together. Okay, last prayer. Prayer number four. Father, help me to accept your love. Help me to accept your love. Let me tell you why this is important. <coughs> if we really get solid, like really solid, in God's love for us. Like we begin to truly comprehend his, listen, his love is unconditional. It's complete. It never wavers. It's perfect. Like if we begin to really accept God's love for us, the influences of toxic people around us goes way down. Here's when toxic people have power, when you need them in your life. People pleasers, I mean, sometimes, have you ever, like, abused animals, I just can't even go there, but if you could for, like, 30 seconds, an abused dog would go back to the abuser, run right back, cower, shake, hoping to be, you know, stroked or fed or loved. People do that because they're so needing that person's validation because they're not getting validation anywhere else. And so they'll take the toxic. They'll stay in the toxic. And they'll be like that, you know, <laughs> pet me, love me, feed me. And it's horrible. But that's the only place they believe they can get a modicum, a crumb of love or validation or approval. But if that person had God's love, like full on God's love, I know who I am in Christ. I know how much he loves me in Christ. Then this abuser over there, I don't need that. There's nothing I need there. And all of a sudden, that person's power, poof, gone. It's gone. 
Now, listen to me, family members. There's a, there a family, I'll be very careful, toxic, toxic. And the child, as an adult, was finally able to say to his parents, I want your love. I just don't need it. So if you want to give it, I'm open. And if you don't, we're done. Now, how could you ever, how could you ever say that? Only if you're absolutely convinced that your identity is in Christ and that you are fully embraced and adored and cherished and loved perfectly by God. Look, look what we read about. Look what we read about God's love. So we know and rely on the love that God has for us. Would you please circle rely? We rely on God's love. Not my parents' love, not a sibling's love, not a cousin's love, not a grandparent's love, not family love. We rely on the love God has for us. What's his love like? There's no fear there. No fear it's going to be withdrawn. No fear it's going to be withheld. No fear that he's going to hold it out and beat us with it. There's no fear because fear has to do with punishment, consequence, separation, uh, abandonment. But there's no fear in God's love because he doesn't separate. He doesn't abandon. There's no fear in it. His love is perfect and it's in place and it's 100% for you. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You, you just don't know it yet. We love because he first loved us. There's no fear in his love. In Jesus' culture, people had come to believe about God that God's love was kind of like flawed human love. In other words, God will love you a little more if you do a little better. God will, you know, throw you a bone sometimes, but you kind of have to earn your way. And if you ever break a rule, oh boy. See, what they, what they did, they equated how God loves with how people love. Very conditional, very give and take, very, you know, reward, punishment. And, and, and Jesus said, that's not how God loves. And so they're like, oh, well, smarty pants, tell us how God loves. Jesus said, okay. He said, God's like a father who had two sons. One was a rule keeper. Perfect kid, did everything right. He stayed home, loved his dad, stayed in a relationship with his dad. But the younger son, now he was trouble. And before he had the character to get his inheritance, he took his inheritance. Before he had the maturity to handle that much money wisely, he took his inheritance. And he left his family, Jesus said. And he went to what was called the far country, and Jesus said there he squandered everything he had. But he wasn't ready to come home yet. Because like most of us, he thought, I'll fix this. I can fix this. I'm out of money. My friends are gone. But I have too much pride to go back and tell my dad I was wrong. Because my dad will punish me. And he'll withhold love from me. And he won't make it easy. So he tried to get a job. But he couldn't get enough of a job to even buy food. So when he's starving... Jesus said, the young man heads home. And Jesus said, the young man thought about his father like people think about God. And the young man thought, I'll have to tell my dad, I understand, I'll never get to be a son again. But would you hire me to work out in the field? Jesus said, that's what you think God is like. That he'd do that. Cut you off, put you in the field. Jesus said, guess what happened? And they're like leaning forward. What happened? Jesus said, while the son was still a long way off, he wasn't even home yet. His father saw him and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. And he said to the other servants, get my best shoes. Put them on his feet. Get the family signet ring. Put that on my son's finger. Get my best clothes and dress him in those clothes. For my son 
has come home. Now, you would think Jesus' audience would have been touched by that. Like, I'm so thankful that's what God's like. It's not what happened. The older brother in this story was like Jesus' audience. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We kept all the rules. We, we stayed pretty nice. Why would you treat him like that? Jesus said, because that's how God loves you. You desire a little bit to move in God's direction. He runs to you and takes you as his child. Now, I'm telling you something. If you can get this, toxic people will have no power in your life. No power in your life. The love of God is the answer. Let's pray before I cry. Jesus, thank you for uh, so much in Scripture which gives us guidance here. And we've done this pretty wrong. I mean, mainly, we really haven't done family toxicity well. But now we have some, some prayers. We have a place to start. But we're going to acknowledge we pray because we're admitting we can't do it on our own. Every prayer says, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me in my family. Help me do it right. Help me do it well. Help me do it in a healthy way. God, help me. We need you, and we thank you that you love us, and you are so ready to help us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.